Good afternoon and welcome to everyone who may be watching this on the replay and welcome to all of you who are watching live today. Thank you for joining us. I have two guests with me today, um, Mr. Julia Stain and I've also got Dr. Anthony Turton. Julia Stain, a brief background, he's an experienced international business executive and turnaround strategist. His experience of organizational leadership principal, consultant, and C-level positions spans a period of 24 years, and he received the Africa Business Leadership Award in 2014. Julius is accustomed to and effective in senior-level executive roles, making high-stake decisions and overcoming complex business challenges. He has a decisive, interactive, motivational management style with a pragmatic approach to problem-solving. He has advised on large international structured finance transactions where he was instrumental in securing funding for major infrastructure projects reigning, ranging up to 5 billion US dollars. Also with us today is Dr. Anthony Turton. He is formally trained in decision making under conditions of uncertainty and risk as a political scientist with 25 years of strategic level experience. Dr. Turton specializes in water resource management at corporate, national, and regional level. With demonstrated capacity to work in high performance teams, his role is to integrate specialists from science, engineering, and technology with policy and strategy. He has pioneered the concept of water as a corporate risk along with the development of methodologies to assess that risk, including an integrated water management plan supported by policy, strategy, and KPIs. He has published widely and is a well-known consultant, professional speaker, trainer, and facilitator. One of his core skills in his capacity is to engage with the media where he has a strong and positive profile currently being used to drive the notion of water as a corporate risk. Today in particular, though, we are wanting to look at desalination as an option. We know that currently the city of Cape Town is seeking to add levies um, and, and taxes in whatever form to raise capital to address the water issue. We're not going to delve into that, but we do want to take a close look at what the cost of desalination is and whether or not that will place any heavy burden um, on the city of Cape Town, but also on its people. So I'd like to start with you, Julius, um, from Graham Tech. Graham Tech has put an offer on the table to the city of Cape Town um, a while back. I think it was June 2017, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, correct. First of all, did the city, there's, there's two questions around that. Has the city acknowledged or responded to that white paper submission? And my second question is, what financial implications did that have for the city? The, the city has um, acknowledged the fact that they have received a uh, white paper. Um, it was presented also in person, in other words, in, a, in, a, in our personal, in a personal meeting with the, with the city council. Was the financial implications? The financial implications was based on on the fact that we, based on all the market research and uh, research data that we had at that point in time, uh, we foresee that it would have been there would have been a major drought crisis happening um, to the city, and it was time to really act where you have a long term, more sustainable, uh, weatherproof, if I can put that in bit commas, uh, type of solution for the city. And that particular solution was designed to provide up to 400 megalitres of augmented uh, water supply as a desalination um, option. 
Um, the funding models that we have provided there would have allowed the city to provide water at around about um, the 10 to 15 rand uh, per kilometer mark. Um, it, that was that was the model at that point in time. It was based on a longer term sustainable financing solution rather than the, the, the way the tenders have been instructed in recent months as very short term uh, um, financing requirements, which makes it which makes it naturally very very, very expensive. Um, does it now help? Yes, it, 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 it does help. But in, in, in terms of, of, of how it would affect the city's budget, would it put undue strain um, on the city? Is it an affordable option um, to look at? Because we've, you know, we've got figures for, for uh, groundwater and there's been this constant argument. Um, I know that Anthony has debunked this when, when we spoke a little while ago. Um, the cost of desalination versus um, groundwater. Is it an expensive option um, from your perspective, the way as opposed to what the city is telling us? The reason why we created that white paper um, was because at one point in time there was a press release which stated that the city considered desalination option of around about 400 megalitres and it would have costed in the region of 16 billion rand. And that to us was just unacceptably high, it was unnecessary high and we needed to understand why it was so high because the solution that we provided at that stage in the white paper was much closer to the 6 billion, in other words 10 billion rand less than what was predicted in the, in the newspaper article. And we wanted to demonstrate that it could be it's not necessary to have such an expensive solution as was uh, uh, professed at that point in time. Also, we subsequently uh, provided a second or an amendment to that first white paper where we indicated how a desalination plant could be used um, as an augmented or a water security initiative. Rather than a primary source of water, it could be used as a, as a, as a secondary or an or a, or a, um, augmented supply. That means the following, that if in the fantastic event that there is sufficient water in uh, surface water uh, sources, that the desalination plant is not necessarily active, in which case the actual additional potential burden uh, on the city uh, uh, users would be in the region of about um, 1 rand 50 to 2 rand per kiloliter. Now, that means the following. The city is effectively weatherproofed because you have on standby, you have in the backs, in your back pocket, so to speak, uh, 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 an ability to switch on 400 megalitres if there is another drought um, uh, happening in the city. Secondly, if, uh, like the Premier has promoted a, a water economy, this water is available. It can be exported, exported in better commerce to other provinces, other regions. Um, and create the water economy that she was speaking about and, uh, and uh, provide revenue um, uh, to the city. So that was the, uh, that was the model that we have proposed. Okay, um, so, so that basically wouldn't have put the city under, under the kind of strain no. that I think we were um, imagining or that we were, were told. Yeah, in our model, we did not rely on any form of government funding. We did not rely on any form of government guarantees. We relied on a very, uh, which is known internationally as a water purchase agreement or a water treatment um, agreement where we would have raised and provided the funding off balance sheet or not via normal city challenges. So the intent was not to uh, put undue capital strain on the city's resources. Right. It would seem that in order for any substantial change to happen within the city and its political chaos that we currently have, um, we would literally need to have day zero happen, which at this point seems extremely likely. In fact, it seems like it's unavoidable because on the 1st of February, we moved to level 6B. 
and it would seem that plans are now in motion um, for day zero. We, we can no longer avert it. So my question to you would be, can Graham Tech at this late point still assist the city in any way, even though we now looking down the, the, the barrel of a gun, as I always say, um, with days zero literally on our, it's not even around the corner, it's on our doorstep. Yeah, we have a, a counter board in our offices called T-97, where it stands at this point in time on our, <laughs> on our counter board. The bottom line is yes, uh, I, can, I can categorically state from Graham Tech and its shareholders, we are absolutely still willing to assist the city in whatever way it will take um, to deliver a sustainable and proper solution to the city. Um, it is, look, uh, predictions are predictions. Um, it, is, it is unlikely, it's highly unlikely, um, that a day zero can be completely averted at this point in time. Um, there is a, an, an odd chance that it can still be averted, but in trying to achieve that, um, so many factors will have to go in favor of the city to avoid, uh, avoid a, a, a day zero scenario. So from my perspective, it is, it, is, it, is, uh, it is necessary that we start planning for a real day zero scenario. As far as, as, as the potential to assist the city, yes. Um, not only are we willing and able to do so, but it is even if it, even if it is not Graham Tech, even if it is any supplier or any manufacturer anywhere in the world, it is going to be highly unlikely for such a supplier to deliver a meaningful solution to the city in time. Uh, these things are not stored in factory shelves, or these, this type of equipment is not stored on factory shelves in warehouses and so forth. They need to be very, very clearly designed and purposefully built um, uh, for the particular solution that they need to be done. So in our case, we already, we've already done a number of designs on a number of sites um, uh, to, to assist the city. Now, sorry if I'm, if I'm ranting on, just stop me if I'm, if I'm saying too much. But uh, you know, to to make a to make such a facility viable, you need first of all access to the right source water. Secondly, you need the right land. Thirdly, you need at least the right power source, um, or as close as possible to the right power source. And fourthly, you need to be able to inject that water into the into the main reticulation systems of the city. Now that. Those are the four major limiting factors in designing an appropriate solution and delivering an appropriate solution in time. The city has all of this. It has availability in at least four to five places in and around the city to achieve just that. And our white paper has been modeled around those solutions and around those areas to achieve it. So you are saying that um, the, the sites that you propose for desalination um, are close is is close enough to the reticulation system. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, um, so seeing as we are now so close to days day zero, how long would it realistically take to get the plant going and to the point where it can actually deliver water? Delivering water is is not the main main problem. Um, we have a two megalitre plant standing in our factory right now uh, that is available instantaneously um, to deliver up to ten megalitres, even up to thirty megalitres, probably in the region of fifteen weeks, ten to fifteen weeks uh, for most most companies. All right, anything more than that will take quite a bit longer um, to to deliver. Now, fifteen or thirty megalitres will not really make a dent to the crisis that the city is fa facing at this stage. They have really unfortunately taken too long to make a realistic decisions in this regard. So the city was, was you know, initially I've seen some media reports, uh, for example, of, uh, of, of I, I don't know, it was 200 or 250 megalitre barges or, you know, a 500 megalitre barge. 
do those things you know are they realistic are they around can we get them a 200 megaliter barge um we have actually in one of our documentations and presentations to the city um, showed them pictures of how a 50 megaliter barge looks and how big it is. Uh, 200 megaliters barge is a is an unrealistic expectation of what what can be done inside the city. These barges do not exist. They are custom built. They are they still need to be built. Even if there's a barge available somewhere in the world, which is the, which is most likely the case. The desalination plant still needs to be built on top of this barge. That's the first problem. The second problem is this barge needs to be connected to a very, very good source of power, which is land-based. It's not necessarily that these barges will come with their own power source to, do, uh, to supply the power to, to do the desalination solution. The third potential problem is that this barge needs to be able to pump the water from the barge into the city's reticulation system. The city does not have the capacity in and around the ports to absorb that volume of water from, from barges in that, in that scenario. The economic factor is, an, is another matter to consider. We, as a, as a businessman and as a, as a concerned citizen, if you're paying the equivalent of 5 billion rand over the next two to three years for a barge that will be remove its anchors and then sail away after two or three years, why not invest that 5 billion rand in a plant that will be built for the city and provide a long-term sustainable and drought-proof type of solution? It's just ridiculous to, to, to do such a solution, um, to my mind. Some of our clients in the Middle East are asking us to look for barges, uh, and they are specialists in emergency and disaster relief types of barges. It is not a long-term and sustainable solution. So... How much water um, can you realistically provide? You said it was, um, what was the amount you, you gave us earlier? I just want to reiterate that amount. So uh, when? In, in, a, in, a, in a very in reasonable a short, short space. space? Yes. Uh, say up to 30 megaliters. Okay. And currently, our usage is... 500 meg well it's not 500 the target is 500 million right but we we seem to be averaging more in the region of 600 um and the yield from the boreholes um anthony do you know roughly know what the yield, current yield from the, from the boreholes is this ballpark figure no, I don't know what the actual number is, but I do know that the ramp-up time for those is absolutely um, uh, off the chart. There's no way you're going to be, going to be getting any significant quantity, maybe 5% of the total total need uh, within a reasonably short period of time. That's assuming that there are no problems with the uh, with the various quality. Uh, no, well, quality, but also also the servitudes needed. Remember, you've got, you've got hundreds of servitudes that you need from these many, many, many uh, different boreholes. So I cannot see that being a realistic solution in the kind of time frame needed, notwithstanding the fact that it has been simply uh, presented as, as the only solution. So, so one of our listeners here has um, just given us the amount. She said we used 618 milliliters um, last week. To my mind, this spells a lot of trouble. If, 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 if we only have a very, very small percentage of what we currently need, um, Anthony, if I can ask you at this point, because you've, you, you, you specialize in water as a security risk, what are, we, what are the risks that we're facing if we are not able to supply water to the extent that it now seems we're going to be having not a not a very small shortfall we're going to have we've got a very huge shortfall of, of water supply it's um, all of this has been modeled by various intelligence services all over the world and in fact one of the most sophisticated models was done by nasa when they actually looked at what happens in fact nasa came to the conclusion that civilization failure is largely driven of all things by income disparity between the haves and the have-nots under conditions of, of endemic scarcity of fundamental natural resources like, like water and food. 
So uh, this has been known for some time. As to how it actually plays out, it is impossible to model because any model has got a has got a certain mathematical logic to it, and that logic assumes that people act in a logical and rational way. What actually happens as people get close to uh, ground day zero is they start behaving irrationally, and it's that irrational behaviour that cannot be modelled. But effectively, in a sort of a nutshell, what it means is that you see a system failure, a system crash. And when the system crashes, it's, uh, there are multiple subsystems that also go down. So let us take, for example, within the immediate short term, when people open the taps and there's no water there, panic, panic uh, ensues. So people then try and find an alternative source of water. And of course, a person cannot survive for too long without drinking water. And of course, uh, you've got a situation where people now are not trained military specialists, they are just ordinary citizens that might be taking blood pressure tablets or might not be the fittest people on the planet. So they suddenly go into a distress situation and in a very short space of time, you start seeing people that are, that are, that are fainting and falling down and you also start seeing looting and stuff like that taking place. So I don't want to sound like I'm painting a doomsday scenario because that's not what I'm doing. These things have been modeled. They are hardcore security risks. We're talking now about, the, about the, the domain of an absolute security professional. And in fact, it was my it was my view some time ago, I made a post to this effect, and I, I sincerely hope that one of the people, one of the part of the team that I left behind with me when I when I created this capacity uh, in the, what is now the SSA, State Security Agency, I, I would like to think that one of those people is currently sitting in the Cape Town office on a daily basis, linking in institutionally into the national security decision-making system, because uh, when these things go, they go very, very quickly, and they go, they get very, very ugly. Um, of course, there's another, another very important aspect that uh, happens in this process. The average person, either the citizen, the average job long citizen, or the average uh, municipal official, or the average business person, is simply unable to think what it means because the entire framework of reference built up over an entire lifetime is based on the fact that water is always there. The instant water is no longer there, they suddenly go into a frame of reference that they've never, ever had to deal with before. So this starts resulting in all kinds of behavior uh, from panic to, uh, to you name it, an entire plethora of behaviors. So we're starting to see now some Business people getting a little bit savvy, but it's, I'm afraid it's too little too late. You know, now we've been speaking about the need to, to, to uh, build in this resilience for some period of time, at least at the level of your own, uh, your own company, your own, if you own a bit of real estate, your own whatever it is, your factory or your bank or whatever it is that you own, your shopping center, building that resilience. That has generally fallen on deaf ears. I can, I can honestly say that very few people have actually listen to it be beyond the point of sale of it being oh, an interesting exercise in an intellectual intellectual gymnastics okay and beyond that not very very little more some of your big real estate developers are have become savvy to this a while ago and they started to do something about it but it's once again it's too little too late because uh, until such time as you as you face with it you don't know what it is bottom line is in a very short space of time you go from a steady state a stable steady state because your system fails you go from a st steady state operation, and steady state means that the banks are functioning and electricity is flowing and the, and the buses are running on time, to, a, to, a, to, a, to an unsteady state, which means that none of those things are working anymore. And now all of a sudden, a new set of rules uh, uh, prevails. One of the interesting phenomena that I don't think has been thought through properly in the plan for day zero is the fact that you've now got certain collection points for water across the city. And, and around each of those collection points, you are in all probability going to get uh, some kind of civil unrest or some kind of civil activity taking place, uh, 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 you know, various uh, little bits of argy-bargy that can rapidly ignite into, uh, into a bigger confrontation. And, of course, you're creating the ideal opportunity, the absolute perfect opportunity for carving up the city into turf for gangs to now start taking control of. So unless you have a very, very robust security force presence uh, that uh, that would have to have been modeled on the same lines as the soccer world cup or any global event they do all of these all of these scenario uh, plans that, that are set out 
you know, beforehand, where the air force is integrated with the, you know, with the police, with integrated with the army, integrated with civil defence, and you know, integrated with the medical recovery people. All of that stuff has to be done. I'm not aware that that has been done to any significant extent in the city of Cape Town. So I'm not a prophet of doom. I'm merely speaking as a, as, as a professional, having been through some of those scenarios and worked out some of those eventualities. Um, thanks for that input. That kind of ties into one of the, the, the questions I wanted to ask you, um, Julius, and perhaps you can both answer to this. Um, our economy cannot escape day zero, and and to me, the silence from the business sector has been absolutely deafening and very, very concerning. I cannot believe that that companies um, are sitting back and not doing anything and literally waiting for the system to collapse. Um, it would seem like that is a catastrophe waiting to happen on a very, very large scale um, throughout the Western Cape. Now, I believe from the statement that the city of Cape Town made this morning, they said that when day zero arrives, we know that part of the plan is that the water will not be turned off in informal settlements, um, but it was also announced that the water will remain on only within the city centre. Mm. However, we have a large number of businesses and industries that are outside of the city centre, large businesses, but not only large businesses, we've got small to medium sized businesses spread all over the Western Cape. Has any one of these businesses approached you um, about a solution that, that you know, can you tell us? I, I don't know if you had liberty to say. Is there a sense that there's any type of concern going on with businesses that we're not hearing about? I think um, it, it is potentially twofold. Um, the one is exactly like Dr. Anthony just mentioned earlier on, um, is that people's total frame of reference has always been there's never been a problem with water. This well-run city, as we have heard it is, has never had this kind of problem, meaning that you can't comprehend what it will be. So people would like to believe the, the positive as opposed to the negative in this regard. Um, on the other hand, boosting that, uh, that hopeful positive view is what is being fed in the media. Things like uh, barges are on its way. Uh, we have just managed to open, a, uh, we're cutting a ribbon for a two megalitre plant in the port. We are drilling for aquifers on Table Mountain that will save the day. Uh, in fact, one media release was that there is a barge already parked in Borden's Bay. You know, these positive messages uh, um, alleviates the reality that is um, out there at this point in time. Uh, if you look at the dashboards of the city, it indicates uh, statuses of projects which appears to be 50% or more complete. But if you read the real fine print of those dashboards, it says these are the status of projects in planning, or it is, it's not the construction quality, or it's not the construction completion uh, status, or Julius, uh, sorry, or can, I, can I interrupt you there? I, I just want to make sure that people actually get this point because it's very, very important. Okay. So we we have had this dashboard from the city of Cape Town um, that's available to us to help us monitor the the progress um, of of new water being brought on to assist us to get through the through the drought, and many of us have been monitoring this dashboard very, very closely. Now, I wanted to ask you, because I'm trying to understand something about that dashboard. There's, there's projects of, of new water, and I'm going to mention one project in, in, in particular, which is the one in Monwabisi. Because okay. one of, our, um, one of the, the, the people in the audience here, um, Sandra Dixon, actually went on site to Monwabisi, and what she found there was a sign indicating that this is the site 
for the Monwa BC desalination plant. But there was no construction going on anywhere. And she went to inquire at the police station and she asked about, you know, where's the construction, what's happening with the desalination plant. And the response that she got was that um, residents objected and nothing's been built. But here's my question. How do we end up with a dashboard that indicates that that project is 58% complete? Is there a life cycle of this project that we are not aware of that's not explained on the city's dashboard? How does it work? Can you break that down for us? I, uh, that completion is the, the words that they've used on that dashboard is to the effect of um, plans in progress. So it doesn't say the construction phase of that project. I am presently unaware of uh, that particular project's whether whether um, uh, citizens have uh, objected to that project. I'm not aware of that scenario. But what I could say is these plants are typically built off-site before they need to move on-site. So I wouldn't be too alarmed if um, there is no, uh, if it appears that there is no immediate activity on the site. Um, they have nine weeks to complete it and they're not yet in the nine-week cycle. Uh, I think their nine weeks only started around about the 15th or 16th of December. Um, I won't be too alarmed about that. I'm unaware of the uh, objections from from uh, uh, the community. I'm not aware of that part. Okay, no, that's fine. I just wanted to understand how that life cycle um, works of of projects, so that. Can I, just, um, can I comment? Sure. Okay, I think uh, it's very important that any project has got a life cycle. There, there's certain cycles to any project planning. The first one is the planning of the project. And I think that is probably what they refer to when they say that the planning phase is now a certain percentage completed, okay? Now, this, is, this opens up a very, very important conversation that I'd like to completely support what your, what your guest has said there now. We need honest communication in times like this because it's the absence of honest communication that feeds speculation and speed feeds uncertainty. So, for example, I was very surprised. I went away on my annual holiday leave and I decided to switch off all of my digital devices and not, and not, not be interested in the, in the world outside of my little bubble that I was living in. And then one day I inadvertently turned it on and I saw to my great horror that one of the city officials, I can't remember his name, made this jubilant announcement that they were so on track with this thing that the construction crews were even on holiday. The construction crews were allowed to go and leave because they were on top of the timelines and deliverables. Now, there's no way on this planet Earth, even if you manufacture these plants, these package plants uh, off-site or in modular containers, there's a very high level of planning involved. And you want to have, have certain civil work that's going to be done on site. So your site establishment can take weeks, if not months, to, 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 to do correctly. So the very fact that a city official could go out there and gleefully announce that they are so on top of, the, of this thing that people could actually go on holiday, don't worry, it's all under control, tells me, I don't think that person deliberately lied. I think that person just didn't actually have, a, have, have, a, have an, an obvious understanding of the reality in which they're embedded. And this is another important factor I want to, I want to uh, illustrate. I've just been asked to write a piece for, for some other for, for uh, another magazine or, or some other media outlet. And in that, I made it very clear that there are two, three drivers to this crisis. And we need to understand those three drivers. And the one driver is a constitutional crisis. The fact that the constitution defines the different roles of the, day, of the different tiers of government and specifically dictates that one sphere of government may not interfere in another. That means that your that your, your, your municipalities that are now suddenly thrust into this crisis situation have absolutely zero institutional memory, absolutely zero institutional infrastructure. Not one person on their staff is, has ever dealt with a thing like that before. So you are really asking a tremendous amount from those people. Now, it could be that they, they employ consulting engineers, and consulting engineers typically take instructions from the client. They don't give instructions to the client. 
So they are, so it's now it's a question of the blind leading the blind. The, the, the client doesn't quite know what is needed. The consulting engineer needs to be guided and directed. So actually, neither of them are, are really at fault unless you start getting deliberate manipulation of information or deliberate skewing of, of, of certain uh, uh, tendering processes and procedures. That I'm, I'm not saying that that has happened in this case. I'm just saying that that could be, could be a possible factor. But we get back to this thing about honest communication. A dashboard is a way of communicating, and it's a kind of a ponytail, knee-jerk response. Oh well, let, well, let's give the masses what the masses need. We'll give them a little, a little, a little widget on their uh, on their uh, computer or a little app, and they can see what's going on day to day. And we'll just get our act together behind the scene. This is simply not good enough. And in fact, I don't want to be critical now, but what I find completely mind-boggling in this whole thing is that neither of the two political parties, given that this is ultimately a political crisis playing itself out here, it's a major political crisis, neither of the two political parties have at any single time made any credible statement other than trying to deflect blame and responsibility and trying to demonstrate to their electorate that what they've done is the right thing, okay? That, uh, you know, that they passed this on to that person and that person dropped the ball and it wasn't me. Now, this is understandable. But the day for that is now over. We can no longer do that. We are now in a situation where we actually have to have credible leadership. And I would like to see the top structures, the top, the top, you know, the, the ANC top structures and the DA top structures, given that they're the two players in this particular space, actually come out there and even show empathy, just empathy with what I see amongst the, the hundreds of people that I, I'm in daily contact with, where there's a rising tide of fear, of uncertainty, of, you know, of, of, of bewilderment, if you like, okay? Where is this leadership? At? Even just to console people and say, my guys, don't worry, it's all going to be okay. We've got it in hand. There's nothing. And that is in part because uh, the rabbit is caught in the, in, the, in the lights of the oncoming motor car and doesn't know how to jump out of the way. That's the problem. So we've got to get beyond that now. We've got to get beyond the finger pointing and the blaming. And we've really now got to actually start talking about minimizing the negative impact of day zero and then talking about What's going to happen post day zero? Because I'm predicting post day zero, nothing will be the same again. I think the country's gone through an inflection point now, and that inflection point means that from this day onwards, the way we manage water, the way, the way we manage uh, uh, energy, which is in a similar crisis situation as we speak, has to be different, has to be profoundly different. But how we extricate ourselves from the mess we're in now with all of the stolen billions and all of the now, all of the siphoned off resources and all of the weakened institutions, etc. How we get ourselves out of that mess? This is going to be the single biggest challenge in the in the post-apartheid history of this country. Tony, I Tony, agree. I agree. We, 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 we really need some some not, not some some major economy. Um, passive leadership. In other words, uh, you, you know, somebody that can make a real fact and factual decision and implement. And it is not, you really need some serious decision making very soon. And it is not, uh, it, it is not something that to a vote, to a poll, to a finger blaming and so forth. You might, you really need to make this happen. Otherwise, uh, it's not inevitable what's going to happen. Yeah, yeah, you know, just to just to amplify that, um, I was brought in by by uh, some legal people a while ago to do uh, an analysis of a failing sewage works up in Gauteng, and the whole idea was this is a massive piece of infrastructure that is failing, and 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 there was consideration being given to to litigate. There was a client that felt that anyone was was to bring in the courts, and we've seen increasingly over the last couple of months that the courts have intervened more and more and more. In, in, uh, where there's been a political impasse. So the, at this point in time, there was some se very serious money at the play, and people were considering now taking somebody to court. And the question was, who do you take to court, and, and, how, and what do you, how do you actually structure this case for uh, for uh, a legal process? But what are the actual fundamental drivers at work? And, and I did a, a really in-depth analysis of this of this major sewage works, and the lessons that we learned from that were identical to the lessons for Cape Town. You have a structural failure, and that structural failure is caused by the fact that the Public Financial Management Act prescribes certain procedures for the appointment of consultants, prescribes certain periods of time that you can appoint people for, that you can enter into contracts for, etc. 
So the fact that the law itself, the Public Financial Management Act, is now the constraint, it means that we saw in the case of the sewage works, a backing and forthing and backing and forthing, a toing and fraying over a couple of years as the ball was passed from one to the other. They tried to do what they could. They tried to procure. They couldn't. Then they tried to do this. They couldn't do that. And eventually you see total systemic failure. Exactly the same is happening here. So ultimately, you cannot rely on the, on, the, on the Public Financial Management Act to give you remedies because that's why they did not give the, uh, give the contracts out for a 30-year period that you need to get your decent payback and your decent uh, uh, price for your, your, your unit cost of water. So this is a structural problem, and that is why, uh, unfortunately, it has to crash. It has to fail before it can be fixed up. And only once it's failed and we, when Humpty Dumpty falls on the ground, can Humpty Dumpty be put back together again in a form that vaguely looks like an egg, okay? If we can stick it back together in some form, but will it be a functional egg? Okay, I don't know. We will, we will get through this. We will survive. I'm not saying we're not going to survive, but it's going to be a fundamentally different place, and it's going to be a very rough journey. So bottom line is that there, we cannot actually rely right now on the current decision-making processes, which have to go from this person for approval, then that, and then 21 days and 60 days for this. You can't rely on that. You almost need an emergency measure, but the emergency measure, by definition now, puts long-term capital at risk. Because once you've got an emergency procedure and someone with capital has put up the capital, once the emergency is gone and you revert back to normal procedures, now your normal government uh, regulatory processes come in and they're going to say, ah, oh, you see that, that, that package plant there? Uh, we now want the following approvals. We want your environmental impact. We want your more social impact, we want the blah, blah, hana, 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 and all of those things take you 10 years to do and they cost you, cost you millions of rand and ultimately put your capital at risk. So we've got to have, I keep getting back to this thing, we've got these incredible solutions, we've got a, a significant amount of capital small will lead to come into the space. We don't have any clear direction and we don't have any policy certainty. And unless you have policy certainty, I'm afraid it is impossible to actually unlock the kind of capital needed uh, certainly from the private sector, and it's, it's impossible to to really deploy the, the levels of technology required for this kind of thing. And just, I just want to wrap off this conversation by saying, yesterday I was at a, uh, on, a, on a business trip uh, somewhere somewhere in South Africa, and I had a very interesting conversation with uh, with a person while we were driving from point A to point B, and he told me something that I want to share with you now. He says that 20 years ago, South Africa had the capability as a country to weaponize weapons of mass destruction, including including a nuclear weapon. So we were in a position where we could develop nuclear weapons, and we were even at that point in time talking about advanced missiles. Now we've gone from that, which is roughly where, where, where North Korea is today, we've gone from that to now being unable to keep the lights on and unable to keep the water flowing in our taps in two decades. So we've gone from one extreme of, of, of incredible technological sophistication to the exact opposite extreme now of, of technological paucity. And this in and in of itself is a very interesting phenomenon to ponder because how have we lost that much cap capacity in a relatively short space of time? And what have we done with all of those technologically savvy people that, you know, that could work out computer programs and that could work out special steels and that could work out membranes and pumps and and, and, and missile systems, etc., and integrate them in a sophisticated way. Where, where are all those people now? And this is one of our big challenges. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll finish there. Can I ask a, a question? Um, a few people have asked this. I'm going to I'm going to raise that question. Given our current situation, where we are now moving into level six B from the first of February. There was a, 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 a previous press release saying that the Department of Water and Sanitation is committed to giving agriculture um, the amount of water that they need to get. And they, in fact, the words are they're rushing to give them the allocation by the end of February. But given where we are now, moving to an emergency level from the 1st of February, would it make any significant impact if they were to reduce the allocation to industry at this point? Would it make any difference at all? Who are you asking? 
Um, either one of you. How about you? Well, they they are they are the agricultural sector and the city sec city side is ruled or governed by a number of quite sophisticated contracts, um, where the agricultural community is allocated certain quotas of water by by agreement. Um, these have already been quite adjusted to lower values, which is, in, from my perspective, almost not sustainable for the farming community at this point in time. So, what my perception uh, and view is at this point in time, they are rushing, if it's that the word, uh, to provide the farming community or the agricultural community the reduced quota um, that they already have. Uh, and that quota is going to be reached very so shortly and then we have a bigger problem because then your agricultural community is without water while well, there is still water in the dams that is available for the, uh, for the city um, users by contract and you are then going to say, well, sorry, agricultural community, we can't open the sources for you any, any further um, or any more. Um, but, uh, but from my perspective, it is managed by contracts long long standing agreements that are in place uh, and I, that's my view and I don't know if it's another view Tony. Tony what's yeah, your view I, on that? Yeah look okay I think uh, there's been some reporting from some of your concerned citizens down there about a certain sluice gate that's been opened at Tiawata's Kloof I think it was and that uh, there's been complaints that this gate has been left open in fact there was even that video that went viral with all the incorrect facts on it uh, that inflamed tensions even more. Uh, the bottom line is that I, I fully concur. Uh, uh, you've got a situation where there's a contractual obligation between the state and the, and the Water User Association, irrigation, whatever, or the irrigation society or agency, whatever it is. And now that uh, the, the, the fundamental rules uh, that that on which that contract is being predicated are no longer valid. So we get into the same situation now where, where the logic is different. You cannot apply the logic from, from that setting into the new as yet unknown we would now call business unusual scenario. We can't do it. So uh, has it been prudent uh, for government to uh, to release the water? It's my understanding they've been releasing the water and they're about to cut it off for various reasons. Now, what I said earlier on about uh, the domino effect, when one subsystem crashes and then another domino falls and another subsystem crashes, and you said these dominoes start coming together and you start getting total, total system failure. This is a classic example now where agriculture there's been growing tensions, and I've actually seen amongst your network of people. Many people are angry against the uh, 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 about the agricultural sector, but the agricultural sector, um, a, is, is functioning in a fully legal and, and, and legitimate manner, and b, they are great employers of people. Uh, so their people are sustained livelihoods from that. But, but more importantly, I, I, some of your, your followers actually talk about uh, with much anger that the agricultural sector produces crops for export, therefore they have no value to it. That's factually incorrect because uh, by exporting crops, we are bringing revenue into the country. So it's a balance of payments issue. It's a macroeconomic issue. It's a tax issue. It's a sustainability of the government issue. So now we start getting to a very real situation where the instant that the agricultural sector starts collapsing, which is now kind of imminent if you if you if you uh, read between the lines. What now happens to those people that start migrating? What now starts happening? The ripple effect of that little shock is a shock in the system. Okay, now the, these ripple effects start spreading spreading out. So we get to this the the scenario that I spoke about earlier on that has been modelled by these different intelligence agencies that suggest the kind of sequencing that these uh, that, 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 that a city could expect under such circumstances. And I'd like to think that the city is at least aware of those and at least has done some, some homework on it and at least has got some sort of uh, knowledge and understanding that they brought into the plan. But the important thing is that we start seeing one thing impact on another because as we speak right now, the unspeakable, the absolutely unspeakable, the unthinkable is that Eskom is about to crash. Eskom, there's, a, there's growing talk that Eskom is unable to pay their employees. So if Eskom is in such dire straits, our full attention is focused on the Cape Town crisis now, but what of a sudden if, if, if that little lot goes, goes pear-shaped and we can no longer keep the energy in the system? So there's been a lot of scenarios that have been done around these extreme events, these extreme cases, and God forbid they ever happen. But uh, there, there, was, there, was, there was work done when, when Eskim was going through its crisis, what they call a black star event, where, where there's insufficient uh, energy on the national grid to even, to even get your generators going again. 
So then you know, your your ATMs run out of money and, and, and etc. And all these sort of things start happening. Okay. Uh, so we don't want to go into that sort of extreme scenario. But this is necessary because you suddenly get into a situation where as system instability is reached, uh, the unpredictable starts to happen. Julius, question for you. Um, if I, I'm not sure if you've if you've had private businesses ask you to supply water to them, um, you can obviously do that. Would there be any impediment from the Department of Water and Sanitation because any licenses um, for water use comes from the DWS? Um, would any of that hold you back in an emergency situation if you were to supply businesses with water? The National Water Act um, has got provisions for emergency and disaster situations which we are now in. So at this present moment, yes, we have been approached by a number of businesses um, that are dependent on water, ranging from bakeries to, the, to smelters to uh, uh, Paint companies. So yes, we have been approached by businesses of that, that nature. Um, we are at this present moment uh, getting our legal opinions on what is our legal position. Um, because yes, you know we are able to deploy a solution. We are definitely able to, uh, to deploy a solution very very quickly um, that could at least reduce uh, the impact of a day zero scenario. And um, we just don't, you know, we want to do it as legally correct and as morally correct as possible. And uh, so, yeah, I think in the next few weeks you will hear a lot about us and what we're doing in that regard. Thank you for that. Our topic today is not really boreholes, but, but, but water is important and obviously people need water um, to survive. Anthony, can I please put a question to you? There was this recent... Um, Government Gazette that was released because there's again questions. There is just so much uncertainty about what that means for Cape Town. A lot of people are under the misconception that we're not in the catchment area that's mentioned um, in the Government Gazette. Um, people are uncertain about whether it applies to, to new boreholes being drilled, whether it applies to um, existing boreholes. Does it apply to well points um, as well as boreholes? Could you quickly just nutshell that for us? Yeah, we get into another interesting sort of debate now because the, when the National Water Act was uh, promulgated in 1997, 1998, it was probably the most sophisticated uh, water resource act in the world. It took some of them the best of everything. In fact, it's widely regarded globally as being the most sophisticated. It's even been translated into Chinese and to, into other languages right now. And unfortunately, what it did was it nationalized water, but it then created a bureaucratic control mechanism that we've increasingly seen uh, to be Im almost impossible to administer and a, a really serious constraint to investment. I'm aware of many investment decisions, substantial. One of them would have been the largest foreign direct investment into the country that did not happen because of uncertainty over water supplies. So let's get back to what the act says. Whether, so whether, whether it's about this water management area or not. What the National Water Resource Act is, is that all water use, there are no more rights to water. All water that is used has to be subject to an authorization. Now, because the authorization is so technically complex, they've kind of like created a loophole that said there's a general authorization. So, for example, you as, a, you as an end user now, you don't have to go and apply for it because there's a general authorization that has been given. So if, if people use that water under a general authorization, and what that might be now under changed circumstances would probably require a very clever legal mind beyond my capability to tell us what is actually, uh, you know, what it actually means. But, but as the law was promulgated in, so let's say the, 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 the letter, the spirit of the law is that all water has to be authorized. General authorization will cover for the normal small time uses of water that don't have to go and apply for license because of the bureaucratic overload that it would, would create. But then you've got another category, and this is now what's called existing lawful use. And existing lawful use applies specifically to industrial and to agriculture and mining, mining uses of water. So any existing lawful use had to have been registered and would be subject to a water use license. 
what's known as an Evula, an integrated water use license application, which is a complicated hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of rands worth of with application process. It takes many years. In fact, many, many mines that I know have never actually achieved that final end goal because it's impossible to achieve. So that implies that, for example, you've got farmers in the area that have been irrigating for a long time or forever. Now, that has been subject to verification as an existing lawful use. And the way they've done that is by means of satellites. So with Google Earth nowadays, there are all these sort of historic records of Google Earth. They can go back and if you say, I've got a center pivot in this field here, they will go back and see, did that center pivot exist before the act was promulgated? In which case, it's probably an existing lawful use. If not, it's not. Okay. So now we get to a situation where because of the crisis, some people are now drilling boreholes and are either using them as a communal water resource or in some cases they are using it as a uh, for example, in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a property development, in a residential estate, they use it to take the estate offline. They now get into a completely different area of, of the act now because they now become uh, uh, water service providers. And as a water service provider, you have to have all kinds of authorization, all kinds of permissions, etc. And at one cynical level, it comes down to the fact that, and you've seen it in Cape Town, as soon as the state starts losing revenue, they wake up and smell the roses and they quickly jump down to, to, to plug the leak in the revenue gap. That's what that special drought levy has been about in Cape Town, and it's called a bitter. You know, you know how deep those, those divisions are. So the bottom line is that the state is fully entitled, is fully entitled to insist on a license, and if it does not fall under a general authorization, they might well insist on some other authorization. If it is not an existing lawful user on their records at the time uh, you know, of, 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 of becoming uh, an existing lawful use, they will not regard it or they have the right to disregard it as an existing lawful use. And they actually have the right to come and pour concrete down your borehole. Now, if, you've poured, if you spend 250,000 rand on drilling a borehole, I promise you you're going to get very tense when the concrete mixer comes and starts pouring concrete down your borehole. But they're fully entitled to do that. There's certain legal processes and procedures. And that is why I've always cautioned against people going crazy and just going out there drilling boils you know, like there's no tomorrow. You've got to do it in a, in, a, in a lawful process. Will the government be lenient? Who knows? We hope in a time of crisis they will be lenient. But ultimately, individual people are spending a lot of money on an unknown entity. And, and what they're getting in the end is not necessarily a legal solution. And ultimately, what they're getting is not necessarily uh, going, to, going to be... Um, Compliant uh, with uh, with water quality. So, for example, the, the uh, my understanding is that the city has got a specific bylaws that says you may not drink of a borehole because because of potential contamination, E. coli, and various other parameters. It doesn't mean to say that people don't drink. It just means to say that if someone does get sick, that uh, that the city has protected us. Ah, but we said you couldn't drink. You drank, and therefore, therefore, liability is on your shoulders. So we're getting into an, an, an area of legal uncertainty now, and it's uh, all based on the fact that the logic used in the original promulgation of the Act is, in fact, a mismatch against the current bureaucratic reality and the current economic and, and environmental reality of the country. That is why there's a great big attempt. I've just heard today now colleagues of mine sent me some things to comment on. You know, this whole thing about the, uh, the, the fundamental change to the National Water Act particularly where they want to create one water management area and one catch and management agency and centralize all of the control once more. Again, people are very concerned about that. Frankly, I think that all this is, is a logical recognition of the fact that our laws uh, uh, are, are, are inappropriate and our procedures and policies are, are inappropriate for the current circumstances. And unless we correct them and we continue to work within the framework of the law, we're simply going to have crash the airplane onto the ground. To, to uh, start wrapping up our conversation, Julius, can I please ask you ag again, just to, you know, we've had a lot of people join us um, a little bit late and they mis may have missed that information. Can you just briefly again tell us um, how soon it would, how, how quickly can you bring on new water and how much um, can you bring on realistically in a short space of time? A short space of time um, in, a, in a type of a project of this nature is probably in the region of about 10 weeks. Um, so in a space of 10 weeks, uh, you know, we can definitely provide at least two megalitres a day 
and up to about 30 megaliters. Now, what, what are the constraints? The constraints are that there are some critical components in these desalination plants which, which are not off-the-shelf items. They are in high demand because South Africa and Cape Town is not the only drug stricken place in the world. Unfortunately, it is all over the world. And, and uh, that means some of these items are what we call long lead time items. And that, that is the constraint. Um, and, and we are unfortunately dependent on some of those highly critical components that takes up to six months to deliver. Uh, you know, it's not, it's not quick uh, to build some of this equipment. So, okay, so basically, summarize. 10, 10 weeks, 2 megaliters, up to 30 megaliters. Um, and, you know, it depends on how serious our client is. If our client is really serious, well, I get on a plane and I fly tomorrow to my supplier and say, listen, I've got a real crisis here, but I'm, um, I, I need the following done. Can you do the following for me? And yes, you know, under those kinds of serious circumstances, you can deliver the extreme. But we have to have a serious client. And at this point in time, Cape Town is not serious. They are, they are, they are not serious. Um, they, they. I, I mean, it was so fantastic when Patricia De Lille went onto the mountain and had all the denominations in the world praying for water. It's just amazing. But uh, that's not a serious solution. Absolutely, I think we're going to need more than just prayer to get through this, um, through this drought, and to get through not only day zero. Final question. Realistically, how long will we be in day zero? That is, a, you know, again, there are several models that can go from the one extreme to the other. The one extreme says there will be no day zero. Uh, and if there is a potential day zero, it could be three days. That is potentially so. Um, then there's another extreme that can say it can last up to three to six months. Uh, um, and it all depends on what kind of rainfall is coming. It all depends on what kind of solution is in place. It depends on, on do we really, really want to continue to use uh, 50, mega, 50 liters of water a day? Is it practical? Um, in, in, in the circumstances we are, where you are uh, turning off uh, pressures and restricting water flows to pipes, you are creating another problem for the city where, where some of those pipes will start leaking because the seals are designed not to be dry. Their seals are designed to be wet and to be in place the whole time. So there are so many things that can drive this model. It is, it is, not, it is not that simple to, to explain. But even so, as we sit here today, where there is no day zero, there are a lot of people that are struggling with their current water, water needs that they need, that they need in their businesses and in their, in, in their uh, homes. Thanks, Julius. Anthony, to wrap up from your side, um, no, your two things feeling on day zero? Yeah, if I can say, the two things I'd like to say to wrap up. I think number one, day zero has already happened in Ugu, uh, the Ugu district municipality in the Port Shepston area. So there is an analog. And because mm. Ugu is an unimportant and significant part of the national economy, people don't write uh, newspaper articles about it, I'm doing my very best to raise the profile of Ugu so that because I happen to have a house there, and I also happen to care for the people that live there. Uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a very poor area. There's a very high level of HIV AIDS. The hospital there has collapsed some time ago. Doctors are unable to wash their hands between surgical procedures. So day zero has already happened. And uh, I, I strongly urge journalists and the people of Cape Town to start just following what's happening in, in Uber. And uh, uh, there are things, for example, like a, a warfare that's a war that's broken out between different tanker operators. Uh, about getting access to certain routes. And in fact, some of the municipal workers actually sabotage the pipelines in order to ensure that the water stays off, in order to ensure that the tankers can continue to run. So you now get this kind of self-perpetuating anarchy that you see. It is not a pretty picture at all. It's something that, that, that we need to avoid at all costs. But my closing statement is uh, that in the recent past, I've had a lot of vigorous interaction uh, with various entities. And the one thing that I've tried to achieve is to flush out into the public the two important numbers we all need to know about. The one number is the cost per cubic meter of groundwater, and the other one is the cost per cubic meter of desalinated water. 
And hallelujah, we now have those numbers. Whether they're accurate or not, we have the numbers. So we can say now that from the government side, uh, the city of uh, Cape Town side, the cost of groundwater is being is being presented as being 14 rand a cubic meter. I'm telling you with a very high probability that the real number is probably close to double that once you've internalized all of your externalities like your your you know your your treatment costs and your and your uh, permission your 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 servitude etc. I think it'll probably be close, certainly over 20 rand a cube, maybe up as much as 30 rand a cube. But the important thing is that we now know that's the target for desal to work to because desalination. I, I'm not aware of any serious desalination operator that is not able to meet water at that price in a totally sustainable way and in a way that is going to ultimately turn the city of Cape Town into a model drought resistant uh, uh, um, model of sustainability. That's the way it's going to be. Okay. So we now know 14, 14 rand a cube. And I, I, I'm, I'm, I know that I know that all the major operators. I won't, I won't mention names, but I don't know of any major operator that is unable to meet that number. That's the mm. number we work to, but we still have to insist. And yeah, I think it's important that, that that you have an active citizenry, as you have in, in Cape Town now, that must insist those 21 questions that I posed in public that have never been answered, never ever been answered by the by, by, by the city. Those 21 questions must be answered, because from those 21 questions. We can now get a proper, serious cost-benefit analysis. We can work out the exact cost per kiloliter of each of the three solutions because that's in the national interest, that's in the public interest that we do that. And I'm, I am personally not going to, going to stop uh, until that happens. Uh, I'm not going to uh, engage in legal action myself. If anyone wants to engage in legal action, I'll gladly support it. And if any activist uh, community out there wants to put in a, you know, uh, a pie of public access information at request, I will gladly endorse that. If it has to go to the public protector, so be it. It now gets messy and, you know, and, 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 and we're now focusing our energy on, on modern solutions. So I don't want to be too much in that space. But that information will eventually come out. And in fact, I actually have had uh, uh, conversations with senior DA members asking them to please come clean because if they don't come clean voluntarily, Will eventually be dragged out of them kicking and screaming, and that's not going to be good for their for their brand, for their image. So I hope they're still going to come clean, because ultimately this problem is too big for any of us to continue to point fingers and to politicise it further. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Um, I think one thing is very clear that um, there's no time for for finger pointing. We need to all be solution driven, um, and I think the the, the goal here is for us to be able to have access to the city of Cape Town. Um, there, there's various professionals that um, have made, like yourselves, who made themselves available. Um, it's just for us to get that message through to the city of Cape Town and to actually get an audience with the city um, who have personally told me that they want to work with citizens um, and I think that they need to prove that. They need to prove that they actually do want to work with the citizens by engaging with professionals like yourselves who are making themselves um, available. Gentlemen, Julius, thank you very much. Um, Anthony, thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Thank you for the audience who have watched this. Please do share it um, and have a good evening further. Thank you and goodbye from me, Brigetti Limbanda in Cape Town, South Africa. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you, Bertel. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.